This is Twit. Obviously, it, it's hard to to talk about this topic and not start at the very beginning of this story, which kind of you know kind of puts a smile on my face because I remember the movie Enemy of the State. I remember yeah. that it was. I haven't watched it any time since like it came out, so I can't necessarily remember if it's historically good. But I remember liking it at the time. Uh, oh no, it's it's actually a pretty good movie. Is I it? Mean, I should I'd watch it again. It. Yeah, go ahead. I, I it, it's not <laughs> two hours badly spent by any stretch of imagination. <laughs> well, that's good because I'm sure you've watched it a couple of times to get a sense of like how fiction can lead to, you know, to creating the future essentially. And that's exactly what happened here. Right. Talk about, talk a little bit about how enemy of the state actually has something very critical to do with what we have with Gorgon stare. Sure. So, um, when I started doing research ab about this, this technology, um, which, you know, we'll get a little bit more into what it does in a second, but, very briefly, it, it watches a very, very wide area from the sky, essentially. Um, people often used an analogy to uh, explain what it looked like and how it worked, which is to say, have you seen the movie Enemy of the State? Uh, because that's sort of the closest analog, uh, this, the closest visual reference to what this technology actually does. Now, to give you a sort of plotted potted uh, summary of Enemy of the State. It's a 1998 movie with Will Smith and Gene Hackman. And in the movie, uh, w Will Smith plays a lawyer in Washington, D.C. who comes into possession of some evidence that um, compromises, in a sense, uh, a number of officials at the National Security Agency. Uh, and so they decide they need to get it back. And they begin to pursue him relentlessly, uh, using all sorts of spy gadgets, uh, some of which were real at the time and some of which were entirely fictional. They tap his phones, obviously. They plant miniature cameras in uh, his house. There's one in his smoke detector. Uh, they put trackers in his watch and his pen and his pants and his shoes. Um, their most powerful tool, though, without a doubt, uh, is their surveillance satellite. Uh, they basically get this giant satellite, park it over the eastern seaboard, and it stares down on the entire area. Uh, it seems like it looks at really the whole, you know, the whole eastern seaboard in a sense. And it watches Dean, the lawyer played by Will Smith, as he scuttles around trying to get away. Um, now, for the average viewer, the uh, the intent with that 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 device was to spark fear and anxiety. Uh, it was meant to demonstrate that, you know, while power is nothing new and the abuse of power is nothing new, these new technologies, these new surveillance technologies in particular, make power all the more vicious and even further rig the contest between the weak and the strong. And certainly watching the satellite tracking Will Smith around really seeming like he has nowhere to go is is pretty terrifying. Well, one night in 1998, shortly after the movie came out, uh, on a Friday evening um, in, in Northern California, uh, a man uh, who works uh, for a, uh, a government lab called the Lawrence Livermore um, National Laboratory uh, was attending uh, a screening of this movie with his wife on a, on a date night. And whereas the other members of the audience were no doubt terrified by what they saw, he was thrilled. He saw this satellite and said, That's a, that's a good idea. We've got to do this, essentially. <laughs> I mean, we, uh, that would be amazing. And so he rushed home uh, and picked up the phone and left a message with his supervisor. And the message was very short. He just said, I have a great idea. Call me. And as a result of that initial call, uh, this initially this very small um, kind of scrappy group um, within this very large organization started exploring this idea. You know, if we were to do something like that, how would we go about it? What technologies would we would we use? Um, and then a few years later. Uh, after the uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had, had really heated up and U.S. service members were coming under constant attack from improvised explosive devices, uh, 
the Central Intelligence Agency became very interested in the technology um, because they saw it as a way of countering these insurgent networks in Iraq uh, who blended seamlessly into the local uh, population. And from that point on, it's just been a roller coaster ride for this technology. I mean, it was rushed to deployment uh, by 2006, and it has been operating in uh, foreign wars ever since. Gorgon Stare is the ultimate iteration of the technology. It is the most powerful one to date, uh, but there are dozens of other systems that have been developed or are indeed still out there. Um, but it all began, as you say, with the 1998 thriller Enemy of the State with Will Smith. It's like six degrees of Will Smith, basically. Yeah, uh, absolutely. As, as relates to surveillance. Uh, yeah. That might be the only time that actually works, but anyways. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how how uh, how developed was the technology in the beginning? Like, like I'm kind of imagining... It's the sort of thing where if you've got a camera covering a wide area and this is, you know, this started development as early as it did, you're not you're not talking like seeing the details of a car down on a street. You're talking like a couple uh, of pixels moving around and like that's the car that we're following. Is that about what yeah. it was in the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. And to be sure, um, the, the idea with this technology is to watch the widest possible area. Right. And so with that in mind, it doesn't matter if a car is only a couple of pixels because what you want to do is you want to track cars and vehicles uh, where they're going and also backwards in time to where they've been from, uh, where they've come from rather. And um, so, yes, you're very much right. It's not going to give you this perfectly crisp image where you can you know, watch a car, read its number plate or recognize a person's face, but you just pass the coordinates of that vehicle that you've tracked and have decided is potentially a threat over to another camera, more like a sort of telescopic camera, if you will, and it'll be able to do that job extremely, uh, extremely well. So the basic concept with uh, these cameras um, is that you have a, an IED explosion. So a car bomb goes off somewhere in Baghdad. Um, if you have the camera flying overhead at the time, you can rewind the footage and zoom in into the footage uh, to that very point in time where the explosion happened. Uh, then you can wind, rewind even further to see where the people involved in that attack came from. Not only that, you can also uh, sort of move forward in the footage to see where they went. Um, now, the idea is that eventually the folks involved in that kind of attack will return to a safe house, some location that is associated with this terrorist group. Now that you know the location of this safe house, you can watch the other cars coming and going from that exact place. In theory, once you have connected enough locations by tracking the vehicles moving between them, you can figure out, uh, as as one uh, as one intelligence, uh, what former intelligence officer put it to me, you'll start to see that patterns emerge. And in theory, you'll be able to figure out what the hierarchy of the organization is, who plays which role, how they're all connected. And that's certainly catnip for someone like, uh, you know, an intelligence official at the Central Intelligence Agency. Yeah. They're not trying to, you know, put steel plating on the bottom of Humvees to explo to, to, to prevent deaths from explosions as they happen in the moment. They want to stop the next attack. They want to find the people responsible. Maybe find the people responsible and extract further information uh, from them. And that was the precisely the idea with this. And it was so revolutionary because previously aerial surveillance cameras operated more like telescopes. You could see your target on the ground in very high fidelity, but you could only watch a very narrow area. And so if something happened outside of your frame of view, you had no way of capturing it. You had to sort of, you know, rely on 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 dumb luck. Uh, one anecdote that uh, was given to me was that uh, a 
predator with one of these telescopic cameras was being used to follow a convoy of vehicles. And there was intelligence to say that there was a senior terrorist leader inside one of these vehicles, but they didn't know exactly which one. At one point, these vehicles reached an intersection and split up. And now those watching had to make a pretty sort of stomach churning decision. Do we go left or do we go right? Ultimately, it was basically a a sort of flip of the coin and they got it wrong. Now, if you were using one of these wide area cameras, you'd be watching the whole city. So it didn't matter if you go right or left. The camera records, as one uh, engineer put it to me, the whole thing all the time. Um, You can see everything and so that problem of the telescopic camera no longer exists. 